Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's broadcast for on the Marin Symphony Orchestra. We've been off for a couple of weeks, but we are back, and it is my great pleasure today to welcome not one, but two members of the orchestra, a husband and wife team, uh, longtime members of the Marin Symphony, clarinetist Larry Posner and his wife, Erica. Hi, Larry. Hi, Erica. Good to see you both. Hi. Hi, Alistair. Nice, nice to see you. And you're not pointing a baton at us at this point. I know. Well, <laughs> not for a little while, but yes. let's uh -huh. let's uh, hope that that's going to that pointing the baton is, is yes. getting closer all the time. I yes. think uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel, which mm -hmm. will be wonderful to to experience. And of course, the, the pleasure to be making with music with you again. But in the meantime, we have each other's company yes. over Zoom. And I'm, I'm so glad that you can spend a few minutes with us all. Uh, to tell us about your lives together in music, uh, on and off the stage, and um, and uh, of course your longtime association with the Marin Symphony. Tell us how long both of you have been members of the orchestra. I started in 1973. Good Lord. Does that make you the uh, oldest serving member of the orchestra now, would it? I, I think so. Erica, how about you? I think I came on two, two years <clears throat> later. Yeah. Um, so. But they were still. Larry, you you auditioned at Tam High was when they were they were rehearsing at Tam High, and then they went to Davidson Junior High, and we both did that. No, back then you didn't audition; you showed up. <laughs> you just showed up. <laughs> uh, those are the days. So when you yes. did show up, this was when Chandor uh, Shago was music director. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Now, everybody that I, I, I never really met him, um, but everybody that I know that knew him said that he was a really, I mean, a lovely man, wonderful musician and quite a character as well. Yes. Do you have any any choice um, experiences that you'd like to share from back in those days, in the 70s? Um, he, uh, I think he was born in the early 1900s and knew the literature of of the 1800s and 1900s and loved it. Uh, one of the doctors I worked with had gone to Stanford and the lecture on Western music that he gave was the best course that Doug had ever taken at Stanford. This man knew music, physically communicating it to us. It took about 10 rehearsals before you could kind of read his body, but he knew it and especially how to do rubato. And uh, I think he'd actually played under possibly Mahler or uh, one of the greats. So he, he really, it was quite an experience to experience uh, that last century's music with someone who'd, who'd lived it really. Erica, was that your impression too? You must have been very, yes, very young when this all started. The, one of the highlights was when he challenged himself and his physical limitations um, by doing the uh, Bartok concerto for the, the music for strings, for strings percussion. percussion and chillest. Oh boy. It was uh -huh. really a push for him. And he had two different orchestras going and it was just a fantastic experience. Because he really yeah, knew that, how it should go, but his body he was not yeah. all that coordinated. It's very hard. Let me just tell you from a conducting perspective, oh, yeah, um, yeah. that is a major challenge. Um, yeah. No matter how well you know the score, mm -hmm. I think I've only done it once, perhaps twice. Uh, it just just to get the roadmap and get your hands with all the ebb and flow of the tempo is very right. very hard. So I, I'm I'm sympathetic with that. Uh, with, uh, with with him now, so both of you, uh, Larry, you you hinted about medical profession. So just tell us all, also about your other other career, both of you of your other careers during these this time that you've been uh, in the orchestra. So uh, I yeah, I was a, a family practitioner in Mill Valley. Uh, the reason I couldn't start with the symphony sooner is I had to arrange my night call because the rehearsals were always on Tuesday evening, and uh, had to arrange coverage. And uh, it, it, um, uh, it was an amazing thing. The, the orchestra was mainly amateurs. They would, uh, for the dress rehearsal, bring in some string players from San Francisco. And then with the advent of the Buck Foundation, which said, oh, go big. Uh, and so uh, they started hiring professional musicians and acting like a professional orchestra. Every time one of the older amateurs retired, they'd be replaced by a professional. 
And I found myself uh, as a good amateur being surrounded by remarkable people. And uh, the orchestra, did that lift your game? Uh, did that did that lift your it, game or intimidate I, you? Or I both? Had, uh, well, I'm still intimidated. The, the, um, <laughs> I, I kind of I get this feeling like George Plimpton in the uh, Paper Lion that that uh, you know uh, and and uh, you know I felt I never aspired as a good amateur that I would be playing in Stravinsky, Bartok, Shostakovich, and um, uh, it's just been. Uh, remarkable, and I've been fortunate in that Art Austin, the first clarinet player, started 35 years ago, and he's trained in the great tradition. The the um, uh, Daniel Bonad, the French clarinet player of the Philadelphia, who trained all of the first clarinet players of the country back then. Uh, one of his students was Arthur's professor. So. <clears throat> how, how should you play the clarinet? What's the lineage? And mm -hmm. in a very gentle way and with demonstration, Arthur has given me 35 years of uh, uh, the knowledge he gained at Curtis and such. So that, that's an extraordinary lengthy amount of time for two colleagues, first and second clarinet to sit the next to one another. I think that's 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 almost They're unparalleled. Like this. And, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. well, the whole wind section. Uh, I mean, it is amazing. We all breathe together. Yes. Uh, we've known each other for years, and uh, any health problems in the family or yourself that anyone has of the eight wind players, uh, they'll, someone wanders up to my stand and asks questions. Uh, occasionally, if they're too uncomfortable, the question is, do you have any Inderol? So um, uh, but we've really a remarkable group, the, the, uh, the, the basic wind group. Now, Erica, tell us a little bit about your life off the concert stage during all this time. And in addition to playing the cello, what else has been consuming your life? Well, in order to stay on the cello without places to play, uh, the two pianists that we were playing with, one moved to Washington State and the other one now has carpal tunnel and was, <laughs> is also um, 80 years old and was being exceedingly careful. So we couldn't play with her. So I've I've been... The most consistent thing is the first movement of the Bach uh, fifth cello suite. Uh, and I can't do the double stop parts, but I can do the other, this long prelude and it's just been wonderful. Yeah, those those double stops are pretty gnarly in the fifth, yeah. fifth suite. Yeah. Not as bad as the sixth. If you have any kind of artist. osteoarthritis, it'll, yeah. you just want to take drugs before you <laughs> play music. And one shouldn't really have to take drugs to 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 play Bach happily. You know, that really should should be the medication of its own sort, don't you think? Right. Yes, yes. There was a, I decided that I wanted some input. Um, so I went on YouTube and I looked up Pablo Casals playing the fifth Bach suite and they had it uh, on um, audio so you could hear it. But then I found on YouTube him playing the um, Berkeley master classes. And I was 14 years old when he came to Berkeley and I had the master classes. Bonnie Hampton was in there. Um, and my father let me miss, you never got to miss school when I grew up, but I got to miss school to go to those master classes. Mm -hmm. And a, the pianist, one of the pianists we play with was one of the pianists, not Roy Bogos, but the other one, Janet, Janet Goodman. Goodman, who's Janet Goodman, Goodenheim, um, yeah. who's yes. a friend. She she was the pianist. All right. Hey, Larry, um, yes. you know, with, what is it about this link between music and medicine? I mean, there's so much evidence to, to, to see so many people like yourself as doctors and also as musicians. What what why do you think that's the case? Well, I'm not sure if that's continuing. The the um, uh, the certainly, I'm, I'm trying to think that the the generation, the children of immigrants, uh, um, totally embraced. Um, so my I'm actually first generation American. My father was brought as a child from Odessa, Russia, and uh -huh. um, the families embraced. European culture totally, and the assumption was that you would take up a musical instrument, and um, uh, and the assumption the the professions uh, uh, were just that's that's what was expected of you, and I'm not sure that the children um, of the 
my generation are as many of them are musicians. Uh, there, there well, I don't know. I'll I'll put that theory to the test because that was but there was a clear link between music and medicine when I was growing up in the mm -hmm. in the UK. And that was not immigrant really? related. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's something in something in the water, or I guess uh, you know. I guess I don't know. A sensitivity to people and a sensitivity to music have uh, uh, a lot in common. So, but uh, that's um, yeah. It's also about listening, um, because I sometime after I had the kids, I became a psychotherapist for a while, and Did you? and it. Um, it enhanced the the playing in an orchestra and having to listen and having to watch um, enhanced my ability to listen to people and vice versa. When I came back to mm -hmm. rehearsals after you know working on this, the 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 ears were just alive. I think that's that's really fascinating. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, yeah. And how many years were you practicing psychotherapy? About uh, relatively short for a psychotherapist, since it's not that active. What about about sixteen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And during all that time, you were still you were still playing in the cello section. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. How about some interesting experiences for either of you? Well, both of you really, but I, in I, any order of the of from your years in the Marin Symphony, any highlights that stick out? Any special memories? Funny, sad, elevated, uh, banal. Uh, I guess I would tell maybe my anecdote um, about part of being a doctor uh, was any questions you were called. So um, uh, at, at intermission for one concert, the personnel manager asked me to talk to the conductor. He had a question and it turns out he'd had a little nosebleed and he was in his 80s and um, I knew he was on blood thinners. So what would happen if his nose let loose in the middle of Brahms' second symphony? What to do? Uh, so I did have my bag in the back of my car and it had cotton pledges. Should I go out to the parking lot, get some cotton, stuff it up his nose? And I thought, <laughs> you know, you, 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 can't, you can't conduct Brahms' second symphony with cotton stuffed up your nose. So I just you told the, the maestro that, um, We'll deal with it if anything happens. And I proceeded to watch his nose carefully through the first movement, second movement. <laughs> Basically, I never saw his baton move. I just, he conducted the whole thing with his nose as far as I was concerned. And Did you get all the through, information you needed through the yeah, nose? And, and we had a bloodless Good. performance, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't uh, depart too much on the screen here, but I had a similar experience in my Lincoln Center debut with the, with the Julia Pre-College Orchestra that on my way to from my dressing room, I, I slipped and I cracked my head open mm. and it started bleeding from my, uh, um, uh, from my eyebrow. And oh, and there's so much blood up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was it was luckily it wasn't so deep that it that it, I mean I made it made a head with the with with the performance, but I was a little worried that it was I was starting to, you know, gush. <laughs> I'm not a good gush. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Erica, how about you? Some some. Uh, I remember you know, one. I don't think it was. I don't think you were conducting yet. There was um, a different first cellist, and she was sitting next to her daughter was second chair and her string broke. And what is supposed to happen is that the uh, second chair person is supposed to hand her instrument over and so that the first chair can mm -hmm. continue playing. And right. this was the Brahms second piano concerto and we're in the second <laughs> movement uh -oh. and the third movement and her string breaks. And yeah, right. So the daughter and the mother, I guess, didn't get along so well, and the daughter refused to give the cello to her mother. So <laughs> the, the, no. the mother puts the cello down and kind of minces off the stage while music is going on. And the pianist said, I think she was that Israeli was, pianist. No, it was Ruth Laredo. Yeah, Ruth yeah. Laredo said she had never seen an act like this before, yeah. and she tried to keep her concentration while she's playing. Mm -hmm while this cellist marches off the stage and then comes back with another cello. And the reason why the pianist would be worried about a cellist walking off stage during the second movement of the Brown Second Piano Concerto is because... Yes. 
there's this long yeah, cello yeah, solo yeah. that yeah. introduces, is it the yeah. third movement? Third movement. Yeah. yeah. Third then, movement. Yeah. And then, yeah. Then when she went to start, she realized she didn't have her reading glasses on. So she gets up while we all wait, walks off stage again, walks back, points to her glasses, and finally sits down. Da, 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 da. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten seems... that one. No, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm not quite sure to be horrified or amused, or maybe yeah. a bit of both. A bit uh, of both. It was really. <laughs> <laughs> what was I think the word Ruth Laredo was is said I've never seen a shtick like that before. <laughs> That's it. That is shtick, isn't it? Yeah, At the end of the day, yeah. So what? Have, what? Have, give me the the thirty eight thousand foot perspective uh, on the Marin Symphony over since nineteen seventy three, what or seventy five in your case, Erica. What are the changes that you've seen uh, that you have welcomed? How does how do things look different from your perspective now? Well, for one thing, you. It has oh. been wonderful to play with Sweet. you. That's, I, that, was, that is terrible because it's going to make, that sounds like the most blatant fishing for compliments. That is I not, know. it is why, no, no, no. why I asked I don't question think you ever. were expecting me to start with that. No. Um, it but has thank been, you. Thank you. And, and West and I, I think we're stand partners or near, mm -hmm. and we were put on the committee to choose the next conductor. And it's been night and day. Um, and uh, to have, the quality of musicianship and the relationship you have with the, the, and the respect. Believe me, the bass players talk a lot. And <laughs> they, yeah, there, there was them, this constant can... nattering going on with the prior conductor. And with this, with you, it's every, everybody is focused on what you want and how to do it. Mm -hmm. oh, so very kind the, of the, you. The, oh. the quality yeah. of the playing and the choice of the music, it's all been, if, if, if you keep going much longer, I'm going to turn the color of my sweater here. So, uh, well, Larry, you can always about... go into the other room and, you know, breathe some fumes and it'll <laughs> breathe some fumes from the from the paint coming from the living room. You're right. Larry, how about from your perspective? Has the the because the wind section is still quite a lot of your colleagues around, but, but overall, there's been quite a lot of changes in personnel. Has that affected the sound? Uh, the yeah, but the I mean, just the intonation of in the old days, you really had to work. Uh, the flute would tend to go sharp on the high notes and uh, various, and now it's just tech. Everyone's there, it attacks. And um, the, the uh, I, I'm just, I'm, a, I'm in heaven that, that um, I get to hear these remarkable things. And just when say the first clarinet has a melody tries to juice as much out of it. And then the oboe gets to play the same melody. Can they squeeze it a little nicer? And uh, it's it's just, I can't believe that I'm lucky enough to get to play with the big boys. Oh, well, it's it's a pleasure. You know, it is a real pleasure for everybody to, to play together. And mm -hmm. I, it's just so, so wonderful to know that you have this incredible institutional history yeah. um and just to get a little bit of a sense of that today it's been wonderful for me and i know i'm sure it's been wonderful for all of our, our viewers as well so um i'm sure we could probably keep talking and for another good hour but let's maybe we'll do a part two sometime but okay. but um but in the for right now let's just say uh, i i know we'll have the chance to make music together sometime soon and i'm really really looking forward to that um, and seeing you in, in the plush again and, and oh, enjoying yes. each other's company on stage. Great. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much for being with us today and, and take care. We'll see you soon. You okay. too. Okay. Bye. Bye.